sometimes you hit the wrong theme song. Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with Science Advisor Matt Moniz and we have a special guest joining us in the studio tonight. We have Andrew Lake co-hosting. Good evening, Andrew. How are you? Howdy, Tim. Howdy, Matt. How you doing? How do? I'm a little rusty. We've taken a few weeks off, so we had uh, we had some computer issues at the beginning trying to get the live stream going of the video on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. It's there. It's not as attractive as it could be because we can't get the Silent Assassin to come back. But uh, for now, we're doing the best that we can. So we're making do. So I started the video, and I, I normally can manipulate it over here, but I wasn't able to remotely get into it and all that stuff. So technical stuff that nobody cares about. People don't tune in to hear how the show works. <laughs> that could be a whole separate podcast. We'll start a Patreon account, and you know, for X amount of money a month, you can donate to hear us complain about how things don't work the way that they're supposed to work for us, which it's our fault, you know? So like we would never say when we have technical issues, we, you know, I mean, no. there's times when we've had to blame it on the computers because sometimes it's the computer's fault, but when it's our fault, we own up to it. And in this case, it's definitely our fault or my fault. So I only work here all week long and yeah. you think I would have tested that. But what happened is, the, the way that I can remotely control the computer through the network changed and upgraded. So I just can't get the old computer to accept that upgrade because I don't have the proper admin level passwords to make uh, things happen. You're locked out. So I'm only the guy that runs all the digital stuff here. You think I'd have that kind of access, but no. <laughs> no, that's all engineer level. And the engineer doesn't want to share his passwords with me. So I'll have to see if he can pop in there at some point this week and make those necessary changes. Uh, but we are here to talk about the paranormal, as we are most Saturday nights. We've taken the last few weeks off, uh, mainly because we had uh, a couple weeks ago was the uh, Ocean State Paracon. Yeah. And I, I spent all day out in the sun, and I was just, I planned on coming in and doing the show, but uh, I think Moniz was out that night, Stephanie was away, you know, we haven't seen Matt for a little while, so I didn't know what was going on. So I figured, oh, oh, it's all right. I'll just, you know, I can grab somebody here to come in and co-host. Or Andy's always said, you know, just give me a call. So I was like, oh, we'll do a show. No problem. And then I just baked in the sun all day. And by the time I, I was like, oh, man, I just don't have the the energy left to do it. So if I had come in and done it, it probably would have, it would have sounded like I was drunk. <laughs> and then we would have gotten all kinds of letters to the station and all kinds of complaints. But I had a, I had a bad situation happen to me just a few days before that. What situation was so that? So I, I, I had these big red splotches all over my legs after working out in my yard. And uh, and I had no idea what it was. I was poison like, did ivy? I get poison ivy, poison You know, I don't, you know, I'm like looking up all that stuff online to see what it looks like. And I'm like, it, you know, it was itchy, but it didn't spread. So I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. And I put some Benadryl on it. That didn't really help all that much. So I'm walking around all day long Saturday at the Ocean State Paracon, like, trying to hide my legs like i stayed at my table i didn't really go out and be sociable and interact but when i had to get up on stage and do my presentation all i'm thinking of is everybody's looking at my legs and you know how the paranormal world is nobody ever just comes up to you and says hey what's wrong with your legs they all have to kind of whisper to each other what they think is wrong with my legs so you know by the time the day was over i was concerned that people would think i was going to have my legs amputated uh one person did come up to me uh one of our our friends and, and listeners and somebody who comes to a lot of our events came up to me and just outright asked me, Hey, what's wrong with your legs? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't really know. So as I was getting ready to leave, that person was talking to our friend, Christy Parrish, who runs mm -hmm. all the paranormal stuff over at the Oliver house. Hello to everybody out there tonight. And she took one look at it and she goes, no, oh, that's triggers. Oh, 
Yeah. And I was like, what? She goes, oh, yeah, yeah. You got attacked by chiggers while you, because I was doing the yard work. And right. she's like, yeah, right. yeah, you must have had chiggers in your yard. I was like, never, never had that happen before. So uh, I look it up on my phone, and sure enough, you know, a chigger attack looks exactly like what happened to me. She's like, yeah, go to CVS, get this chigger cream. So I ah. went home, and I got it, and I put it on my legs, and it was like, ugh. Such relief. The best feeling I've ever had in my life. That's the one thing about New England. It's like as soon as the... You know, the spring and the summer comes, man. We get every bug and bugs. That, we it's don't unreal. even know that we have. Oh man, it's unreal. And and the ticks in this part of the world are like the Walking Dead. Yeah. Well, that's that's something that I want to ask you guys about because it's a story that's been going around. You know, we're going to talk about some of the the different news that's been going around in the couple of weeks that we've been off the air because there's been a lot of stuff going on. Uh, a lot of it very paranormally related. But one of the stories that's come out and and it's it's been picked up by some of the mainstream media outlets is. Uh, there's a, a report that the government may have been weaponizing ticks. Yes, that this is this had been a rumor, but from what I see from a, a news story I picked up on, supposedly our government is admitting that they may have created Lyme. It was uh, basically weaponized syphilis, from what I understand, and that's why it's called Lyme disease because of Lyme, Connecticut, yeah. and Plum Island is right on the other side of the sound, and a, I've been hearing for years. That the reason why doctors were treating it like, oh, I don't know what it is, I don't know what it is, is because our government was stepping in and going, you just keep quiet about it, because they let the genie out of the bottle, and it's caused a serious problem. I mean, it's not, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just going to talk out of my ass here about what I think that I know about Lyme disease, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not fatal, it's a chronic illness. And it's just awful. And, yeah, well, yeah. it's terrible to have, but it's, it's, it's just something that will just make your life hell. Yeah, I mean, just everything from achy joints to just you know, being tired all the time. and So I can see that having value of being weaponized. Oh, yeah. You know, and, 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 and being made. But the problem is, is there's active measures being done by people to eliminate the ticks from their yards. I mean, there's a number of, oh, my God, geez. I just saw the Kowloon's mobile vehicle on the TV behind you. Oh, oh man. Now I want some Kowloon. Anyway, yeah, sorry, are. didn't mean to get distracted. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't take much to distract me. Well, but the I'll tell you, will definitely what's one it. of the best uh, tick extractors around, and that's a possum. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in Rhode Island, we don't have that many possums. I haven't seen a possum in years. Um, and, I mean, people complain about them like, they're oh, they're ugly, they're rodents, and all blah, blah. That's a bunch of nonsense. Possums eat tick eggs. And ever since I've seen the, the, the possum population decline in Rhode Island, the ticks are just off the wall crazy. I mean, it's like a science fiction movie. I mean, there's a whole cottage industry now of people who are making these sprays that can spray yeah. your yard down to remove ticks and, and mosquitoes from your yards. If it was that much of a problem, if ticks were that much of an issue, I would think that, you know, the county or the state or whoever is in charge of the, the various spraying here in Bristol County, the county does the spraying. I would think that if they were spraying for mosquitoes, they would spray for ticks as well. Yeah, they seem to be more concerned with the mosquito problem than the tick problem. Yeah. Well, mos I mean, mosquitoes I flying can get into your house. Ticks, yeah. unless you're out rolling around in yards and, out in the woods. Not to say that they yeah. can't come into yeah. animals. And also, the, and the diseases things. that the mosquitoes are carrying are fatal. Yes. So that may be part of the urgency of that as opposed to the other. But, I mean, it, it, it seems like Lyme disease is becoming an epidemic. I, I know so many people have had it, or yeah. have it, I should say. We have a couple of our listeners I know. Um M Melissa June Daniels, Meredith Kent, uh, several other people. They probably don't want you giving their medical information out on the radio, Moniz. Well, th these are people there we'll, advocating. We'll, de app. we'll delete that from the <laughs> podcast. I'm just, I'm just messing with. Them. But you know, that's that's the thing is it's it's become far more prevalent than it was like when I was younger. I didn't know anybody that had it. No. And and now I can you know I can name like Moniz First, did. I can name multiple people that I know that are suffering from it. And and now it's various levels of it too. Right. So, you know, like, oh, well, I had Lyme disease already, but then I went out and I got bit by another tick that made it worse. It, it first started making a real appearance in the 90s, early 90s, late 80s. That's how 90s. I remember it, yes. Yeah. So either way, I mean, whether it's weaponized, whether there's nefarious reasons behind it, or whether it's just a rise in ticks and a rise in Lyme disease in them, be careful. Yeah. Uh, because like I said, I, all I did was mow my lawn. And I thought that I was going to be okay. Now, I know to look for ticks, and so I'm pretty pretty slick about it. You know, like I wear, you know, the white socks, and I usually would pull them up and cover my legs. I had short socks on when I was mowing my lawn this time. But, you know, usually I try to 
limit the amount of area that they can get to. But I had no idea about chiggers and what they do. You can't even see them. I actually have a natural soap that will guard you against them. And I noticed that this lotion that I used, the the cream that takes the itch away, is also used as a, a defense against them. Oh, there you so go. it says that you can like put that all over yourself before you go out. But that usually, you know, regular deep woods off and stuff like that should work too. But uh, you know, I had no idea about these because you can't see them. No. And no. it they don't just they don't just crawl on you. They crawl on you until they find exposed skin, and then they burrow into your skin. So if you're eating anybody out there, you know, you might yeah. want to. Yeah. Stop for a moment because they they crawl inside your skin and then they start releasing their saliva into your skin cells, which turns them into mush. And then the chiggers eat the mush and that's how they Mother survive. Mother nature is just wonderful. Yeah. It really is. And I, like you look at some things and you think to yourself, why does that need to be? Yeah, exactly. I can understand the eyelash mites. You know, I understand we've got these tiny little dinosaurs walking around on our eyelashes, uh, eating all kinds of stuff off our eyelashes. There's, well, there's a symbiotic, yeah. there's a symbiotic relationship there. But uh, no, chiggers and ticks and mosquitoes, and, just no, can't stand. Yeah, them. ticks. There's really no reason for either. Yeah. So, so the possums eat them. So what? They'll find something else to eat. Yeah. If they can eat a tick, and, and people make the mistake of thinking that a tick is a bug, it's not. It's an arachnid. Yes. Right. So if they can eat a tick, they can eat a spider. And, you know, spiders are, I, listen, I don't really dig spiders, but I understand that spiders have a lot of value. Oh, yeah. So, like, let's let Ecologically, the, yeah, yeah, let's let the spiders and the possums and all that kind of stuff do their thing. Like, the one thing, like, hot, uh, wasps and hornets. Oh. What, just no point. Yeah, what purpose? <laughs> what purpose do they serve? I know. Honeybees, yes. But wasps and hornets, they just... I'm, I'm considering moving to Bermuda. Even though everything on Bermuda is ex insanely expensive. But after going there and they said, oh, we don't even have hornets and, and wasps on the island because nobody ever brought them here. This place is yeah. paradise as far as I'm concerned. Well, as far as yellow jackets nests, I'm the guy in the army movie that trips on the, the trip wire or steps on the Claymore mine. I find the yellow jackets nest on every walk. I will stop to take a rest right on top of the yellow jackets nest. All the places I could stop, I find the yellow jackets my, nest. My unnatural fear of them comes from when I was five years old and we were camping. And I was walking along in the campground and I stepped in a nest and I fell. And I'm sitting in this nest with all these yellow oh, jackets yeah. flying around That's me and awful. buzzing around me. And not one of them stung me. But... My dad comes over to pull me out, and you know he gets stung, and he's allergic. Oh, so and and he, I feel bad for him because he always has like the worst luck. He used to be a salesman, um, and so he'd be on the road, and, and this is in the days before cell phones, so we'd have to stop and use a payphone to call in all the orders from the day into the office, and uh, and he stopped to use a payphone one day, and a hornet flew out from the earpiece into his ear and stung oh. him inside the ear, so oh. and he had to go to the hospital. So no, no, good. I tried to avoid them. I've only been stung once that I'm aware of. I was walking out of the auto zone and I put my hand on the, you know, the door yeah. yep. to push it out. And when I wrapped my hand like around the little handle, apparently he was underneath there and he stung yep. my finger. That happens more times. It's happened to me. I've known other people get stung like that. Yeah, because people are walking in there with like sticky, gross stuff on their hands, and so it's attractive to the hornets to go in there. And so this thing stung me, and and it, and it hurt for days. And everybody told me, like, that's not normal for it to hurt for days, so maybe you're allergic. I'm like, well, I'm just never going to get stung again to find out. Japan has it worse. They have a, a hornet that's about the size of the microphone in front of you. Yeah. And, and those things are absolutely insane. At like, least, when I saw that on National Geographic, yeah. I'm like, I'm never going to Japan. But I don't at least care how nice like the that, people are. I'm never going to Japan. I feel like I could fight it. You know, oh, you not, can punch this thing. It's yeah. so big. Not if, <laughs> but not if there's a swarm of them, but if yeah. there's one of them, I could fight it. I have a hard time, like, fighting... One or two, because uh, like they can, you know, they can get around. No, and seriously, these things dwarf, literally dwarf hummingbirds. They're they're, they're enormous. They're science right. fiction huge. I mean, they'll take your wallet and, and, <laughs> and they'll rob you blind. They'll drive your car. They're huge. I get them in my house all the time. Not those ones, thank God. But I get uh, I get hornets in my house, and like every time one comes into my house. I, I look at him and I say to him, like, listen, this can go one of two ways. <laughs> one, I can kill you. Yeah. Or two, I can let you go, but you got to go back and tell the others the story. Yeah. You know, like, because that's a that's what you do, like, when you're a, a you know, when you're a bad guy in a movie. You know, you kill everybody but one so that one can go back and tell everybody about what you did. And so that's what I always tell these hornets. I'm like, you can be the one that gets away, but you have to go back and warn everybody else. And, uh, and generally, they just keep flying in my face. So they're, they're just <laughs> yeah, that's killed. it, yeah. I literally, I, I, <laughs> I buy those cans of spray that you use to kill a nest. Yep. 
and I just like spray that entire can on the one hornet that's on the door. <laughs> I'm like, I buy these cans for two dollars a piece. I don't care. I'll kill. I'll waste the whole thing on you. So that's my uh, that's my hornet rant. <laughs> uh, I understand the bees. I understand. Like, oh no, honey bees, bees are fine, but they don't bother me. And you know what? Like I've never really like had a problem with with bees. Like no. they don't. They you don't bother really, me. You have to really mess with bees to get yeah. stung by them. And Hornets will sting you just because they don't like you. And is it true uh, that a bumblebee doesn't sting? Correct. You're talking the big, black the big ink. fat ones yeah. that have like the hairy butts. They don't sting, right? Correct. So they can hang well, out in my yard all they want. Yeah. And uh, but one thing that I do have tons of in my yard, which helps, is dragonflies. Yeah. So because dragonflies attack the hornets, and and mosquitoes. So they yeah. they I like the you know all the dragonflies because I live near a pond. So all yeah. the dragonflies that want to hang out in my yard, they're welcome. Last week I saw something that I actually the the week that I came back from Ocean State, so two weeks ago I saw something I hadn't seen in a long time: lightning bugs. Oh yeah, they yeah. were out this uh, year uh, in Greenville, or as some people might call them fireflies. Mm -hmm. But uh, I hadn't seen those since the last time that I saw some of those was the night that we were investigating Ventford Hall. And the whole backyard yes. was lighting up with them. A couple you know? weeks ago, I was at the Huckamuck Swamp uh, in, in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and the swamp is full of fireflies. They were everywhere. I mean, those are, those are as far as I know, those don't bother people at all. No. no. And they're cool to look at. We also get greenhead flies, which are the worst. Greenhead flies, if you don't know, they're just like, they're like nature's a-hole. They just fly around. They have these like... Um, uh, like these talons that like rip your skin and so they just land on you and rip your skin and fly away like for no reason like what'd you do that for yeah we've got deer flies down in uh, Exeter and West Greenwich Rhode Island are those similar I think they're oh, the same yeah, thing they're, they're, they're as big as your thumb and I'm not kidding you when we I've actually had to like find a dead one to show it to people to prove that I wasn't kidding them and I'm told it's because they have a lot of livestock in the area there's a lot of horses and cows so they have a good blood source to, to feed off of but they're so big you think it's a plastic toy i mean it's that big it's ridiculous. We're, we're five years away monies we're five years away from another cicada infestation yeah. yep down the cape yeah. or or uh, cicadas as some people say yeah we call them cicadas my where i come from but when i was living in forestdale when the first infestation happened that i lived through they, everybody called them cicadas so and what was interesting about them is like, everybody warned us, and, like, there were stories in the newspaper, like, you know, it's coming, this is going <laughs> to yeah. happen. We're like, yeah, right, whatever. It sounds like something out of a horror movie. It is. And then, like, literally overnight, it just happened. You know, like, at first, you know, you saw some of them on the trees. You're like, oh, that's cool. You know, you see, like, the carcasses on the trees and uh, and then, oh, the exoskeletons, whatever. And then uh, all of a sudden, one day, you just walk out, and your entire yard is a carpet yeah. of these giant ugly bugs. And, you know... The trees are covered with the living ones, and all they do is buzz all day long. And it's, and my sisters would walk out of the house. They'd have to run from the house to the car, because if they spent too much time outside, their hair would get full of them. Because oh was yeah, flying oh around. yeah, I yeah. In 1981, we had a gypsy moth infestation in Rhode Island, and again, you couldn't go from the door to the car without being covered in their webs and them. Gross. You'd come in the house and. Someone would have to take them off you as soon as you got in the house. They were all over you. Yeah, those you don't want to bring into the house either because no. they'll cause damage, right? No. Well, they're just irritating. Their fur can irritate people. Um, the little hairs, the protective hairs. Uh, the poop was constantly falling out of the trees. You constantly had little beads of poop in your scalp going from the car to the, the door. If I want to get it hit with unreal. poop. No, I don't want to see that. Don't show me that. <laughs> take that away. Yeah. So, yeah, that was terrible. They finally... They finally, yeah, they finally sprayed it and, and, and got them all, but it was a nightmare. It was an absolute I'm nightmare. not afraid of all these paranormal topics, but don't be showing me Asian bees and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Get a twenty two rifle to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a call on the line here, and if anybody wants to call in during the show, 508-996-0500. But uh, just so you know, some of the other topics that I want to discuss tonight, uh, I do want to talk about, uh, you know, we had the passing of, of Rosemary Ellen Guiley yeah. this past week, so I want to kind of cover that a little bit. And, and we, we haven't had Andy in to talk about some of these other uh, great uh, folks in the paranormal world who have passed away over the last couple of years, so we'll get his thoughts on some of that as well. And we'll also talk some... Rhode Island haunts, I'm sure. Uh, we can talk about, you know, Andy actually uh, is a guy who is, uh, uh, you know, we talk about what a great storyteller he is, but he also leads tours out in Rhode Island where you can actually sign up and go out with him for how long? These are pretty significant uh, tours. They, they, five to six hours. I, I let people uh, set the pace. 
So, I mean, you can't spend a better day, especially, uh, you know, in this nice weather that we've been having, uh, you know, to go out and learn some of these stories and hear some of these stories from Andy. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But let's go to the phones. Good evening. You are on Spooky South Coast. Hello, yes. Hello. You can't see. Oh, I haven't put the audio through yet. No, it looks like everything's going through. No, 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 um, I'm looking at Everybody it right now on YouTube. Everybody else is saying it's fine. Try hitting, re- try hitting refresh on your on your browser. Okay. We're not getting it. I'm I'm looking right at it on YouTube. Very weird. I'm seeing it on my right. End. It, Hmm. Oh, wait. <laughs> Maybe it's working now? Yeah, sometimes if you go into the chat room, uh, if you go into the YouTube before the stream actually starts, like then you have to hit refresh when we actually start. Some some browsers will automatically refresh. Some need to be refreshed manually. Okay, thank you. I'll tell you All right, no problem. Bye-bye. Bye. And, uh, yeah, so if anybody ever has any problems with the YouTube channel, that's the best thing to do. Just hit refresh. And if that doesn't work and you're still having problems, log out, log out. Yeah, close out your browser, reopen it. And then if that still doesn't work, just don't worry about it because it's probably not a great show anyway if you get to that point. And we <laughs> but we've, we've actually had, um, you know, some people that have reached out to us and, and, and said to us, uh, you know, I, I, I love the show, but... Uh, you know, you haven't been updating the archives lately. And so we had an issue, and we've addressed this a little bit here and there, but we had an issue with the podcast server that we use. We use a company called HipCast, which we have been with them since 2006. When we started yep. doing this show, we signed up with HipCast because back then, first of all, there wasn't a lot of services that would help you out with podcasting. But also, uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. And HipCast, for nine ninety nine a month, would allow you to have unlimited bandwidth, unlimited hosting, and they would create the RSS feed for you and they would farm it out to all the different places that would take it. So that sounded good to us for 10 bucks a month. And so now we've been grandfathered into that and we don't want to leave HipCast because now that the show, this is episode 581 of Spooky South Coast. So to store all of those audio podcasts, uh, some of them are you know significant in size because in the older days yeah. we <laughs> we had the the equipment wasn't as good so we had to have higher quality shows uh you know higher quality files to have good quality sound so if that makes sense like we kind of had to go we had to kind of boost things a lot in our processing afterwards to make up for what didn't always carry through now that we've got all this great equipment and we were able to record directly from the from the radio and all this kind of stuff you know we don't need to have the files as large but the files because they used to be so processed were really big in the early days so we've got these huge files and if we had to take all of that and host it somewhere else where now they charge you for that kind of stuff because you know in 2006 hipcast didn't know what was going to happen so uh, we we have always been very cognizant of the fact that we've been grandfathered into this deal and we don't ever want to lose it so you know like every couple of years your your credit card expires because they send you a new one and we're like we better make sure we change hipcast first because if we miss one month of this they'll make us go on the different plan so we've been uh you know very loyal to them over the years but they had an issue and uh, i want to apologize to anybody that had this issue but they really really had some problems and they went on for over a month uh, or, or a little bit in the late spring and they didn't really own up to the problems like we were a little bit concerned myself and some of the other uh, friends of ours who use hipcast i've recommended them to everybody so lots of our friends use hipcast for their podcasts as well and so they weren't really being up front with everything we felt and we felt like there should have been some not only better explanations but maybe some uh you know, reparations for what they were doing to the to these podcasts by by basically making it so that people were turning away from them because they couldn't get the fresh episodes. But we hung through, we stuck it out, and then we've kind of just been watching what's been going on because if we weren't happy with the way things were going, we were going to have to go with a different podcast service, which would have meant, at the very least, you know, we would have been able to put the the new episodes up 
but who knows what would have happened to all those archives. Yeah. You know, would we have been able to load them up? Would we have been able to afford the bandwidth that would have been associated with that? Uh, were there other ways that we could get them out there and distribute them? As it is right now, iTunes only holds the fr the last, like, 200 episodes of a show, or the last 100 episodes of a show or something like that. So we've actually had to have HipCast create us uh, multiple archive feeds for oh. us to submit to iTunes to be able to make sure that all 580 episodes can show up. So, so we have like four or five different ones. So they've been working with us for that because like not a lot of their shows have as many episodes as we do to have to worry about putting them out there. So we were kind of like the first people they had to worry about this with, I think. And so, you know, they've been very helpful to us and all of that stuff. So we want to kind of stick it out and see what happens. And so uh, it looks like over the last couple of months, they've got stuff together. And so uh, over the past week or so, I've been catching up all the episodes. So as of this evening, actually maybe about 20 minutes before I left for the show earlier, as of this evening, every episode is all caught up to date on the audio podcast. So if you listen to the show that way, and you've been missing some of the episodes, they're all there. Now, there's not one for every week because we haven't been here for every week uh, over the course of the last few months between all the different things we had going on. But every episode that we have done is all uploaded there. So you have 580 episodes available to you right now. As for the video, and I kind of got into it with a listener this week uh, over email, but listen, like we're doing the best that we can with the video. And, uh, and we try to make sure that we get it up there as fast as we can. The, there's a, there was a process that was involved in this. And, and when Matt was here, he did a great job of turning around the video the next day and getting it uploaded up there for people to watch the show as it was. And, and we're not, we haven't been doing that. We've been basically just making the live version of the show available for people. Uh, so we're trying to, you know, pick up steam with that and, and get things going that way. But we appreciate your understanding and again and i hate to I hate to say this and i hate to sound like i'm you know making excuses or like i'm not taking it seriously enough but again this is a very part time thing that you know we don't i don't have a lot of time to spend on doing all of these things and none of us are paid for it right and we don't get paid for it it's not part of my job here at the station um, I have tons of other stuff that I have to do now. In fact, I added more responsibilities onto myself recently. So, I mean, if, if it got to the point where a massive number of people had a problem with the way that we were doing it, then I might have to say that it's just not worth doing it anymore. You know, the video aspect is great, but if it's going to be that much of a pain, we'll but, just go back to just doing minute, the radio isn't show. Isn't this a radio that's, show? I mean, that's the, that's the master that I'm trying to serve first and foremost is you know putting out a good radio show and then putting out a good podcast for it afterwards uh the 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 videos just don't get as many viewers as the podcast gets listeners so if that's the way that i have to look at it i have to say you know what the the podcast takes precedence because yeah. that's where people seem to be wanting to consume the show so uh again we're we're not trying to make excuses we're just you know ho hopefully you can have a little bit of understanding with that if not we understand you know, if, if, if it's an if it's an annoyance to you, if it's a, if it puts you out to have to wait for the show or if it's, you know, not something you can watch live, that's OK. That's why we make the show available as many different ways as we can. I mean, ultimately, it's a bad idea. It really is. Oh, it's yes. a bad idea to spread the show out as many ways as we do. It's a bad idea that over the years I've said to every online network that says, hey, can we carry your show? Sure, Absolutely. You know, just make sure you link to the website or you link to WBSM or something as part of it so that, you know, people know where it's coming from. But, uh, you know, we've never said no to anybody that wanted to, to run and carry the show. So we've let it spread all over the place. But you really, you shouldn't because how do you keep track of everything if it's going to all these different places? You know, how do you know where it's going? Uh, we're lucky that, you know, our podcast server gives us some pretty good, not wholly accurate numbers about what the downloads are. But... For the most part, you know, we're putting this out there in a variety of different ways. Whenever we controlled it better, we would have better control over it. But we don't we don't want to do that. We want to make it as easy for everybody out there to watch, to listen, to however you consume it so that you can do it. Because that's what it's all about. We're just trying to create some a couple of hours of entertainment and information for you and then give it to you in the way that you can consume it the best. 
So that's my little rant on that. And I, I do feel bad that people start counting on something to be a certain way and that we can't always live up to that. And I understand that other other shows can't. You know, the person that emailed me said, you know, I know of another show that's a one-man operation, that it doesn't have these same problems. You know what? That's that's great. That one man is probably better at it than I am. <laughs> that's I, I, I can make no apologies for that. We never went into the show saying that we were experts in all these different ways of, yeah. of putting the show out there. We just try it. And we we try to make it work. Do you remember the old days of... You know, stick cam where we had like one oh, little yeah. webcam. At one point, we were using just the webcam on my laptop, so the only thing you saw was up my nose for the entire show. And and uh, we had the original days of trying to stream the audio where Matt Costa would come in and have to put the show on the air and then drive to my house and feed the audio through to the live stream and then come back and before the first commercial break because I didn't even know how to take a commercial break. You know, like we've we've tried a lot of different things and uh, we've innovated a lot of different ways. Not to you know try to make it about that but uh sometimes sometimes we try things and they're ambitious and sometimes we can't keep up with them so yeah. that's we're still here yeah. there's still a show one way or another um but anyway hopefully uh hopefully people don't have too many problems with that if you can listen live too and i understand this this person that wrote in you know, it's, it's not a possibility for them but if you can listen live and you don't I recommend that you do. I recommend that you jump into the YouTube chat room and hang out with everybody because there's great people in there each and every week and you want to meet them and hang out with them and discuss things with them. And there's great recipes to be found in there. You never know what you'll find in there. And uh, you never know what Nightbot will do. I think Nightbot's on. I don't know if Nightbot's on. Matt usually turns Nightbot on, but uh, we'll we'll see what's going on. So uh, let's take a, a phone call here. Good evening. You're on Spooky South Coast. How are you? What's going on, Lamone? So I, I got to ask you, Lamone, you know, being out there in Vegas, did you get attacked by those grasshoppers? I think some of those grasshoppers got into his phone. Yeah. I. It, it does now. Whatever you're doing, don't move. <laughs> uh, but I feel like it's my fault. I feel like it's my fault, though, Lamone, because I was watching The Exorcist 2. And, uh, you know, there's all these swarm of swarms of locusts attacking. And then I, I turn it off and I see on, on cable and I say, oh, man, what's going on? And it turns out it's probably my fault. Uh, I, I'm not planning on it, no. No, no, I, I have another thing here in the Berkshires in September. Well, we've got Moniz, who's, you know, here most of the time. We've got Andrew Lake, who's a longtime friend of the show uh, and who uh, has been on multiple times. Yeah, well, he, he, he's he been in talking about a lot of different things, uh, and, and he's one of the, the best uh, paranormal investigators in the area. He's one of the best storytellers in the area, and there's no better person to go to than if you want to know anything about Rhode Island haunts, you, you want to go to Andrew Lake. Uh, 
I, no, not this week. I, I haven't heard from Matt Blystein uh, to see if he has one for us yet. So I haven't because uh, he knows that we've been running around. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we can reconnect with him. Oh, I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it's, uh, I'm hoping that he got a nice recharge on his vacation, and that you know now he's, he's got work to do. So he doesn't, he can't worry about us when he's got work to do. This, this man's a professional. This is what he does for a living. Yes. Right. Two young kids and, and, uh, and I like to say, you know, I like to say his poor wife, Emily has three kids to deal with. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Okay. All right, well, we'll 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 save the rest of those when I come out there, Lamone. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll try and see if we can do it. I hear the air the airfare is getting cheaper and cheaper, so you never know. And I know I can crash at your place, Lamone. Yeah, well, hey, peop, it's a, it's a happening place to be. Everybody wants to head out there. Oh God! <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll hold it there, Lamone. Thank you for the call, and and you have a great night. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's weird. Oh, gross. I've 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 had window air conditioners for a long time, Lamone. I've never had any of those things come in my house, so you should be okay. All right. Well, you you enjoy that, and we'll we'll talk to you next week. You as well. Take care. <laughs> Take care, bud. All right, see, All right this, later, Lamone. This, this is where I just uh, start fading him out. I, I love Lamone, but uh, he's definitely a, the fade out kind of caller. Uh, but uh, we 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 in, we enjoy hearing from him. I know, like, not everybody in the chat room feels the same way. But uh, as well, long as you can kind of keep him on track and com compartmentalized, it's, is that your first Lamone experience, yes, Andy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he's a well. He's a unfortunately, character. the people on the stream in the chat room can't hear callers come in. But unfortunately, like, no, we, no, uh, they about? they can hear him. They heard I turned it on later, but then then they wondered why they couldn't. They, they went. They knew why I didn't turn it on at first. I was trying to help them all out, do them a favor. So uh, yeah, but uh, anybody that wants to call in five zero eight nine nine six zero five hundred, that's the number to call in. And uh, you can also put your questions in the chat room. Just do me a favor. If you do it, uh, try and um, you know if you have a, a major question, put it like in all caps. Because sometimes the conversation gets going so fast, we can't always see them. And we don't want to miss out any on, on any of those questions. But coming up in the next hour, we are going to take a break for the news because we're, we're on the regular radio. So we'll take a news break coming up at the top of the hour. And then when we come back, we can get into some of these more topics. But I do want to talk about the passing of Rosemary Ellen Guiley because it's hard. Because we all grew up 
and uh, and I know that Moniz and Andy are both a little older than I am, but we kind of all grew up reading and learning from the same people. Yeah. And not not that I want to you know call them old, but that old guard has reached the point now where they're starting to pass away, and I don't know if there are definitive enough voices coming up in that next generation that will be those same people that people will remember. I think that we're blessed in a way that we have so many people involved in this field now that there are a number of voices, a number of researchers, a number of authors, a number of lecturers. There's all these different people out there now, but there's not going to be those standout kind of authoritarian figures in this field like we had in the in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. No, we are losing them. Yeah. And as we do that, you know, this it's it's not that people aren't replacing them in terms of uh keeping up the work. We're just not getting those they're not icons. And maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. But uh at the same time, it I worry that if we don't have icons, uh then, d- then does it become a little bit too mundane and doesn't get the attention anymore that it would. So we can talk about that, and we can get your thoughts on that as well. But, uh, you know, we lost Rosemary this year. We lost Brad Steiger recently. Stanton. Stanton Friedman a few weeks ago. Yeah. We lost Art Bell last year. We lost Jim Mars last year. We lost our Gary Patterson last year. I mean, the the list goes on and on of those who have passed away recently, and and we're going to see more and more of it happen. Um, I think for us, you know, in the time that we started this show, we had some uh, episodes in the early years where, you know, we had to, to deal with the passing of Ed Warren. Uh, we had Lorraine Warren Lorraine pass away just a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. So, uh, but we, we dealt with the passing of Ed Warren early on um, and the passing of Hans Holzer early on. And it just seems like everybody who influenced us for, for good or for bad, everybody who kind of set that tone of what we were all reading and, and, and learning about growing up as they pass away, I just, I don't, I wonder if there'll be kids, like, not that we really idolized a lot of these people, but you kind of do in a way, you know, you, you kind of grow up idolizing and saying like, oh, Ivan Sanderson, oh, yeah. John Keel, yeah. oh, Hans Holzer, these are the people that are talking about all this weird stuff, and I'd like to be able to talk about weird stuff someday. I wish it could be my job to write a book about ghosts, you know, but... It just it it doesn't have that same impact, I guess, on the younger generation. Maybe because it's so much more accessible to them, and maybe maybe that is a good thing. But uh, I don't know. I just worry that if you don't have your your icons in it, then you know it loses some of that authority. Especially when you have all these television shows that are going out and and looking for people to talk to about this, and you've got every single random paranormal person, and I don't mean that in a bad way. But you've got every random paranormal investigator making it onto television in some way and getting these, you know, five to 15 minute segments on and, different television and, shows. Yep, and that's it. And and you you can't go, you know, nobody's going back to them for no. more things. They're not becoming a, a, a voice, even though they could be, you know, like how many of the, the people that we know, could, like Andrew should be the guy anybody goes to when they want to talk about Rhode Island ghost story. But there's other people telling Rhode Island ghost stories, so they don't really... Just go to you. Right. And in doing that, people don't now recognize you as the person that they should because there's so many offerings for people. You don't go and type into a computer search, Rhode Island Ghost Story Authority, and have Andrew Lake be the only person that comes up. You know, there's a lot of different options now. And so that makes it uh, just kind of less of, you know, we used to love to hear those voices growing up. You used to love to if you turned in, tuned into Art Bell. You wanted to hear Stan Friedman come on. And, yeah, you might hear 45 other UFO investigators over the course of the year talking on the show, but you really waited for those Stan Friedman shows. Or you really waited for those, you know, Hans Holzer appearances on television. Yeah. Or, you know, you wanted to see the, the In Search of episode with the Warrens. You know, those uh, you'd be watching these, these reruns of it on A&E in the 90s and be like, I can't wait for that episode to come on about the Warrens, you know? Like, that's it's it's going away and we've got some tv celebrities that kind of get idolized in the mix that way and then they get all kinds of extra money to do things that are crazy like buying the the mm. the murder house from yeah. the Manson murders, which we'll yeah. talk about that coming up in the next hour too but as as that kind of stuff goes on you know we just we kind of lose those we lose our heroes 
and there's no new generation of heroes to replace them. So we'll talk about that more coming up in the next hour. Again, we'll also take your calls, 508-996-0500. You can also put your questions into the chat room at Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com or on our YouTube channel as well. And you can also uh, email them to us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com or tweet us at SpookySC. So there's many different ways to get involved in the conversation, but our favorite way is the good old-fashioned way. We like to hear your voice and have you call in with your questions. So we'll take your calls and we'll talk about all these topics and more coming up on Spooky South Coast. We'll take a break for the news and then we'll be back with more in just a few moments.
Paranormal Talk Radio, you love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk Entertainment, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Welcome back. Our number two of Spooky South Coast, Tim Weisberg here, along with, well, Matt Moni stepped out for a minute, but Science Advisor Matt Moniz is here, and also Andrew Lake is here with us tonight, guest hosting the show. And uh, and Andrew, somebody also brought up uh, in the chat room another person that passed away uh, in the time since we've done this show that we lost, Bud Hopkins, as well. Oh, yeah, I met who, Bud Hopkins. Uh, Mo- and I know Moniz worked with him uh, yeah. with the Intruders Foundation, and uh, I think that was the first person that was associated with the show that we really lost because uh, he came on our show and then, and Moniz warned us. He's like, listen, he's not well. Uh, He may not be able to make it through the entire program. Um, And I think that he did. If I remember right, he made it through the whole show, but uh, he was just warning us that, you know, he, he hadn't been well. And then he passed away not that long after appearing on our program. If I remember right. Um, but uh, it just it goes to show that there is this this generation that came before us that uh, we are, you know, we're slowly losing, and we've we've got to kind of make sure that we pay homage to them while we can. Moni's we were just talking about uh, having um, you know Bud Hopkins on. He was somebody yeah. else that that Becca in the chat room brought up that we lost in the time since we started their show. But I mean, some of the folks that we've lost are, you know. People who were limited in what it was that they did. They weren't these wide-ranging voices in the paranormal world. So Bud Hopkins, you know, is is a legend, but he's also a guy who dealt with a very specific area. You know, right. you, you have somebody like like Brad Steiger who passes away, who kind of encompassed a lot of different right. things. And, right. and Rosemary Ellen Guiley was somebody who <laughs> did that. I don't think anybody was more wide-ranging than she was. I think over the last few years, she kind of hyper focused on some some topics uh she did a lot of work uh, researching and writing about the gin um she did a lot of research and work writing about uh, i know she was working on frank's boxes uh, for quite a while but uh, in general i mean when we used to have her on the show and i wish we just had her on more than we did she was always willing to come on it's just a matter of you know i would wait till she had a new book come out and then when she started having more and more you know, books come out, it just became to the point where we're like, well, we can't have, she wrote three books this year. Do we really want to have her on three times in a year? So then they kind of want to yeah. pick your spots of where you have her come on. I mean, I would have had her come on every week because she was just that great of a guest, but, you know, we try and make it different voices in the program. And every time she came up this way, she would hang out with us. Yeah, she was always, you know, she was coming to this area quite a bit. Uh, she was probably, I think she was the first, you know, one of those heroes that we had the chance to actually meet, Matt Costa and I went and saw her at uh, the old Capers meetings at yep. Cape Cod Community College. And those were the best because Derek would always invite us out for Chinese food afterwards <laughs> with whoever came. And so that's how we got to, to really meet and hang out with a lot of our, our heroes. And and she was somebody who, she researched a lot of different topics, but she never lost the information that she gathered in writing those books. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, not a political statement here at all, but you watch the the Robert Mueller hearings, and here's a guy who, you know, couldn't recall things that were in the report that he was part of. And even if he didn't write all of it, and of course he didn't write all of it, he had a team working with him, but even if he didn't write all of it, he probably 
had plenty of time to read it going up to you would hope the time you would that if the he hearing put his happened. Name to it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he read it then, but I mean, just go over it again in the time leading up to the but, hearing. But he didn't retain that information. Rosemary was yeah, the exact yeah, opposite. Yeah, she was like an encyclopedia. Yeah. I followed so yeah. that. She could hold that information. We actually used to yeah, refer to her as, as Rosemary yeah. Encyclopedia Guiley. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because, she loved that. Yeah, she, I, I got to, to meet and hang out with her uh, once, uh, uh, too. And I, had, um, I knew of her uh, knowledge and you know, uh, all things fey, you know, the leprechauns and the wee folk and so on and so forth. And I had just had a uh, a very fascinating story about the wee folk told to me by a uh, CNA working at a nursing home right up the road from me. And uh, it was an absolutely amazing story. It was one of those stories that absolutely convinced me these things are real. And she was one of those people I knew I could share the story with without her rolling her eyes halfway through it and going, no, no way. And not only that, she was able to tell me what she thought the fairies were, what type of fairies they were, because she said everything about my story was dead on to a certain type of fairy that takes care of sick children and the elderly. And uh, after that, she shared with me the story about when she went over to Great Britain and parts of Europe to, to look into uh, you know, the fey folk and fairies and, and leprechauns. And she looked me straight in the eye and told me I brought home a brownie. I know I did. I saw him uh, shortly after coming home from Great Britain. And what made it even funnier is uh, a few months after having a, a sighting of this thing, she was leaving gifts out for it, shiny objects, tobacco, that sort of stuff. She had a friend she hadn't seen in years from college come to stay with her. And she says, hey, you have the whole downstairs. It's all furnished. It's like its own little apartment. So come and go as you please and, and all that. So she's about to go to bed that very first night, and she hears her friend come running up the stairs like, you know, like her butt's on fire, and she's all upset and nervous, and Rosemary asks her, what's wrong, what's wrong? And her friend just kind of stares at her with that, you're not going to believe me, look at her face, and goes, you have a tiny little man down there. And she goes, yeah, I know, I think I brought him home from Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> but the way she told the story was so matter-of-factly, and it was just so, it was so funny, but I, I felt relieved that I could share that amazing story that was shared to me about you know this case in a nursing home involving two patients telling the same story and they had no connection to one another. But apparently there's a nursing home on Route 44 in Smithfield that is visited by the wee folk who come and sing songs to the, the people who are about to wow. die. And uh, it, yeah, it was amazing. Oh, well, and that's, that's what's great is she was somebody who looked at it and said, listen, I'm just going to hear weird things and, and I can't say that they're not true. You know, I, I wasn't there. And, but she also wasn't afraid to go out and look for things herself, too. Right. Like, if she got right. a report from somewhere, she would travel around uh, to try and look into that, which not a lot of people do anymore. I can verify that in person because uh, I met her in Rhode Island. I was, I was introduced to her by uh, Peter Robbins. Uh, I met with her at, at a f mutual friend's place down in Rhode Island. And uh, we organized a trip over to England. We went over together and researched crop circles out there. So I, I was out there she, for a that's, week and a half with her researching crop circles. That's how she wanted to be. She yeah. wanted to be boots on the ground yep. and be and out there she was. doing it herself. And uh, But like I said, she never really like scoffed at anything that anybody told her. We might scoff at some of the stories. You know, We might read some of the stuff in the books that she wrote and be like, ah, that sounds a little bit too ridiculous, a little bit too fantastical. But she never felt that way because she felt like, you know, kind of the way that we look at doing the show and, and the guests that we have on where we say, well, it's their story to tell. It's not our it's not our job to tell them what they experienced or didn't experience. We're just giving them the outlet to share it. And she just did what we do in the written form, which I think is the kind of the, the approach that a lot of people take, you know, just let people have their say. And she didn't she wasn't worried about um trying to figure out the reasons behind the stories. You know, she was very Fortean in that way of kind of collecting the story, presenting it to the person and then letting the person decide for themselves. Yeah. And, uh, and I won't lie, you know, I would frequently have to refer to her encyclopedias for a variety of different things as, you know, as I'm coming up and learning about this stuff, when we're doing the show, you know, when we never came into this saying that we were experts in anything that we just kind of wanted to learn alongside the audience. So I would keep her encyclopedias handy and say, okay, this week we're going to be talking about this. Well, I know I'm going to go through Rosemary's encyclopedia of that. And that will help kind of prepare me a little bit for some of the things that will come up. So at least I'll be familiar with terms or, or stories that, that might come up in the course of it. And I remember when I had a family member who was being plagued by these dreams where she was really, really upset by it. It was the same recurring dream all the time. She was really upset by it and didn't have any idea what it meant. And I said, well, listen, I can kind of armchair 
quarterback this for you a little bit, or armchair psychologist this a little bit for you. Um, but, you know, let me see what I can find in, in some of the books that I have. And the first thing that I did is I went to the Nightmare Encyclopedia, uh, you know, Encyclopedia of Nightmares, Dreams, whatever it's called. And I went went to that. I think the Encycl- Nightmare Encyclopedia might be Jeff's book. But anyway, I went to, her, to Jeff's books and Rosemary's books. And I start looking through those and I start saying like, okay, what are the, some of these themes that she's talking about that are coming up in her dream? And I'm kind of putting together something. And I'm like, listen, here's what I got based on what I have. And she's like, okay. And I gave it to her and it still wasn't really kind of resonating with her. And so then I said, well, wait a minute. Why don't I just go right to the source? And let me just, let me just email Rosemary and see if she's got any insight to this and if she's willing to give any insight. And not only did Rosemary give insight, but she called her and spoke to her to kind of, you know, go through it all with her and kind of make her feel a little bit better from it too. And, uh, and it turned out to be a positive thing anyway. It was a, a change in career, but it was just a very much um, apprehension about that that was kind of manifesting in the dreams. But in the end, the career that my relative chose was far better because uh, she's a lot happier. She makes a lot of money. She got to travel around the world, and she met somebody. So it all kind of worked out well. But, you know, a lot of what she was having in these nightmares was her fears based on that and really based on the fact of, I'm on a track here in my life where I like where it's going. This could be better, but it could be worse, and I'm afraid to take that chance. So I think Rosemary might have even helped to encourage her. I'll have to go back and ask, but I think Rosemary might have encouraged her to to make that leap. Um, But that's just the kind of person that she was. You know, I think everybody in the paranormal world probably encountered her at some point, and I think they all kind of walked away with a positive experience from it. Uh, We did have... (laughs) <laughs> this is this is going back to the days when we tried to help people with quote unquote evidence. Uh, but uh, there was a few years ago that uh, Dave Francis and I started a a Facebook group for people to be able to submit things that they captured on film or audio or what have you for them to submit to us into this well into this group, not to us, but to the people in this group who were knowledgeable in all the different aspects of you know, investigation and what some of these false positives could be. So, you know, we had Frank Grace in there kind of uh, helping people figure out any photographic anomalies. Um, you know, and, and, and one of the people who volunteered a- actually asked to come and be a part of this and help was Rosemary. And so people are submitting their stories in there, submitting their, d- their data to her, and she's kind of helping them go through all this. And, and Zaffis came in for a while and he was helping out with it too. And it just turned into this whole thing where suddenly we became bullies because we were telling people, like, that their evidence was crap. Like, no. We never told anybody that their evidence was crap. What we told them is, it could be this. It's probably this. You know, and Mm. by the way, you've got two of the most seasoned people in the paranormal world in Zaphis and Rosemary telling you that that's probably what the case is. But somehow Dave and I became the bullies. Like, like, as, like I somehow didn't want people to find the existence of the paranormal and put it out there to the world. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're right. No, you're right. This is, this is just what I wanted to have happen. And somebody actually, Gation, I never do that. Listen, we just had this conversation yeah. last week. My first ever residential case after 13 years of doing this show. Moniz, you know this. I've never gone to somebody's house and investigated before. How many times have I asked you to come with me? Right. And I just, Andy asked me to come by. I just happened to be like 20 minutes down the road that night. And I said, you know what? I think I'm going to go out and do it. And and uh, so I go and, and I say to everybody afterwards, I'm like, I don't know if you can believe this or not, but this is my first residential case. I mean, obviously I've been like in family members' houses and helped them out or close friends or anything. But it was the first time I ever went into somebody's house that I didn't know. And uh, listen, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, let you know, Alicia did catch an EVP. Uh, she she sent it to me. Yeah, yeah. the pit. Mm-hmm. Someone saying the word pit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right when you were wearing that the the headphones. So that was a weird experience because, you know, we we're in this house and um, in the back end of the house is like a it was kind of like a sunroom area. Yeah, that was turned into like a, her bedroom because the lady becomes sick. Yeah. yeah. So she yeah she's she's on oxygen so she can't move so she's staying mm-hmm. near the oxygen tank, um, but it had like a sliding glass door, and we had closed the door. 
and uh, and of course, being like the hottest weekend of the year. Yeah. And he's like, I have an investigation. I'm thinking to myself, it's going to be at a house that doesn't have air conditioning. I know it. <laughs> and, and we show up, and they had an air conditioner. It just wasn't doing any good. And uh, so we're in this little room with these fans going. And uh, we were getting ready to – well, actually, it's when we, we were trying to record for, for EVPs first. Right. And, and I heard something audibly with my ear that nobody else heard. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, you just didn't hear it. Like, it, it happened, and you just weren't paying attention. Like, I'm not getting any kind of psychic. Right. I don't have psychic abilities or anything. I don't have clear audience or any of that. And then I heard it a couple of times. But I couldn't, you know, I can't rule out that it wasn't somebody outside on the street, you know, talking. And then I, I just happened to hear it, and nobody else did. Uh, but you had headphones on listening to your recorder as it was going, uh, which I'm assuming is probably a little bit amplified yes. in the room. And, That's a very and, good microphone. And you didn't hear it, no. so... I mean, if you ask me, you know, did you hear a disembodied voice with your own ears? I'd say I probably thought that I heard something when I didn't. Well, it was, it was interesting that we were told that uh, she had just lost her grandson named Eddie. And the name Eddie kept coming up on, on your device. Oh, yeah. Well, when, when, once we turned Echo Vox on, it was yeah. a whole different story. Um, and then... The lady's haunted by people who have died recently. She right, it's, it's nothing. It's she's nothing lost negative. A, an old boyfriend, a grandson, and her. She's just become kind of like a, a bus station for ghosts. They're all coming to talk to her. And as we're telling her all this, she's just like, "Yep." You know, she was very straightforward, very matter of fact about it. Uh, but uh, I, I wonder though, <laughs> just thinking to myself afterwards, you're trying to convince people when you go and, and, and investigate their homes and help them out with their, their personal paranormal problems, you're trying to convince them that you are a, a serious researcher yeah. of the paranormal. Yeah. And, uh, and you're like, you know, I've got some friends that are going to come by and help out in this investigation. And in comes this dolt, and I'm pointing <laughs> to myself for the people that are listening on the radio, that says, I want to put on some headphones and tie a blindfold around my ears and just tell people what I'm hearing. Like, it was fascinating, though. But it didn't go through your head at all? Like, geez, why did I invite this guy? No, no, I'm telling you. No, that's why I did invite you guys, because I wasn't sure what we were dealing with, and it, and it turned out being what my gut told me. Not a haunted house. It's another haunted person. Mm -hmm. From time to time, I run into these cases. It's not the house. It's the person or the family. And the more you talk to them, the more you interview them, you mm -hmm. find out they've had so many people drop dead around them right. lately, and it was unfinished. I mean, when someone passes away from HIV, that's just tragic. The guy died way too young. Maybe about 30 years old. Yeah, I think. and uh, I find it very interesting that I turned to the kid's mother, and I said, have you seen him in dreams lately? And she says, no, but the kid's cousin standing right next to her, his mother says, shows up in my dreams almost every week. He's mad at her. <laughs> you know, it was an interesting family. Well, I mean, they had Caribbean, they had African, they had Cajun, they had uh, Narragansett, they had uh, uh, Se what, Seminole from down Florida. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, it was unbelievable, the, the quilt that made up that family. But I had no doubt that uh, psychic ability runs rampant. And, and nobody that was there was against what it was that we were doing. No, no. You know, everybody was on board with it. And they weren't running around saying, you know, like they they were believers, but uh, they weren't the kind of believer. I didn't, at least I didn't get the feeling that if you had said to them, listen, I don't think there's anything here. I think they would have accepted what you were saying. I think they would have said, you know, maybe it's just not here because you're yeah. here, but they at least would have, they wouldn't have been the kind of people that are like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, this place is so so haunted. No, you know, they, they just seem to be accepting of it and understanding of it. So that's one of the things that, you know, you got to worry about when you're going into these residential places is, you know, how much of the story is true and how much yeah. of it is them wanting attention and how much of it is them misidentifying things oh, that are easy to explain. It's explainable. very, very tricky. And it's been a couple of times where I've called uh, people mad himself. I've, I've asked people to come along and it turns out to be a big old nothing. But I try not to look at it that way. I look at it as an you know experience. Right. You know, I get to interview somebody who's not being honest with themselves or they're not being honest with me or I get to meet somebody who's maybe not wrapped a little too tight. So you have that's experience. It's experience as an investigator. And the more you do that, the more you can kind of learn signs that you can pick up on yeah, going yeah. forward. I was just going to say, you yeah. learn to pick up, okay, I've seen this, yep. you know, song and dance before. Well, Moniz and I, we, I think we've talked about this a little bit on the show before, but in the early, early years, you know, especially then, I didn't, I definitely did not feel comfortable <laughs> going out into investigations because I was still getting my feet wet. 
And I would always say, well, I'll go along maybe as an observer, but I don't want to be an active participant. There's no such thing as just an observer. Right. You're a participant. But he starts telling me about this case, and he's like, listen, I think I have an actual demonic case. that, um, and, and he doesn't throw that word around a lot. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, I, I want you to come and take part in this because, like, if it goes the way that I think it's going to go, not only will be, will be, will we be going up against something that you you may never see again, but also like you're probably going to have to experience an exorcism. You're probably going to have to like really be there, and 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 this will test your metal and and see if this is really for you. And you know we were going back and forth about it, and he was calling me and telling me about it, and I'm like I I, I don't know, I don't feel right. I don't want to be the guy that's in the room when you're dealing with something that is either demonic or somebody thinks is demonic, which is just as yeah, dangerous yeah. or whatever. And I'm the guy in the room saying, well, I don't really have any belief system, so I don't contribute anything here. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it worse by being there. And all the, you know, it was a lot of discussion going back and forth. And I think you had Keith Johnson involved. Yeah. And it turned out it was more something else, but it, and that's the hard part about those type of cases. Right. It was, you, you, it, it was, it yeah. was, it was a weird place. Talking about the one it, in Coventry. Yeah, yeah, that was. It was weird. There was, there was some was, things going on. Yeah. yeah. Well, then he called me and he's like, yeah. "Listen, it's, it's, it's not, it's not what we thought." You know, I guess you, but, had, you had made some sort of discovery with the family and. Yeah, but there was still stuff going on in sure, the house. But it's not. It's <laughs> yeah, not but, what. You, right. And you have to say to yourself that okay they have stuff going on and it's 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 interesting and i would like to be able to investigate and document the activity but you have to know when you'd be stepping on a landmine by going in there and doing it and right. having the you know the wherewithal and and the ability to sacrifice to say you know what i'm not going to touch this one yep you know and uh and, and i don't think that, that happens nearly enough i think a lot of people look at that and say well We'll just take that into account in what we're doing, but we can go and insert ourselves into it. And the next thing you know, you're not only making it worse for them, but you're making it worse for yourself. Yeah. Because now you can't just walk away at the end of the night and say, we'll get back to you. You know, now it becomes constant phone calls and texts and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's it's not everybody that can know when to walk away. So I'm glad that you guys did that before I actually convinced myself that I had to go and experience it. <laughs> You know, but I mean, listen, uh, you know, we, we're going to this house and the, like yeah. Andy said, the woman had been sick and she's got medications laid out onto the table and all that stuff. And all I'm thinking to myself is, you know, I know Andy, I know he's very thorough. At some point, somebody looked at those bottles and found out what she was on and what she's doing. Like, you know, because i had had a good discussion with her daughter who was living in Florida and, and brought that up. I mm -hmm. said, how, what are the chances are it's her, her meds or, you know, maybe dementia setting in. But I'd had a good conversation with her daughter, and I trusted her that no, she was there was nothing she was on that was going to cause hallucinations and and so on and so forth. And they also said no, we know mom's not crazy because we have so many normal conversations with her about everyday right. things. And then when she says, "Hey, the ghosts are acting up in the house again," no, she, there was no doubt about it. She was the she was the um, the dominant voice in the family. Oh, definitely. So they would know if something was up. Yeah, she was the center of the hub. You know, they they certainly they 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 lived and died by her every word. Um, but you know, that's I've asked that question to investigators. Like, I love to ask that question when I do lectures and I'm doing like a paranormal 101. I always say like, what's the most important book for a paranormal investigator to own? And I get answers, everything ranging from you know Hans Holzer's Ghosts to you know Chris Balzano's Picture Yourself Ghost Hunting to the bible but the real answer is what's the most important book a paranormal investigator could own do either of you know the answer that i'm thinking the pharmaceutical guide the yeah. big book of pills yeah. that's the most important thing you can have because that's what you need uh you know unless you have medical knowledge and don't need the book but if you have the book then you go in and you say okay well this person is on this drug and this drug and this drug and this drug and it should be part of your your questioning pro your interview process of somebody now do you do you broach that question? Oh yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah, I mean, as soon as you see there's any kind of medical issues going on, that's yeah, when but the, you don't just ask it that's anyway. That's one of the first. Well, things yeah, you I do. like to bring it up, so uh, you know, I understand. Well, you don't ask about the medications directly. Uh, what is your family history, and is there, a, you know, how is your family health? You bring it up in terms of, you know, how, how is your health? Oh, you you have that. What what medications do you take for that? Mm -hmm. You know, you you broach it that way. Well, I and mean, I mean, listen. Here's the thing, like, you're not the law, you're not a medical doctor, so, like, I would just say to people, like, hey, just be honest with me, like, what drugs do you do you take, what ones do you yeah. do? 
Like, because it doesn't really, like, I'm not going to rat you out if you're like, well, I have a Coke problem. Yeah. You know, I'm going to just take that into account. But the problem is people yeah. won't be honest with you because then they're afraid that you won't give them what they want you to be there for. Um, well, I had a case in North Providence that was, I, I believe, was legit. The only thing was, though, it took me a while to, to get the family to be honest with me that there were members of the family who had serious drug problems. But originally, when they first contacted me, that was something that was uh, kind of skirted and and uh, kind of avoided. And more I got to know them, it was like, be honest with me, the guy was smoking a lot of crack before he died. That's, yeah. You know, that's... And then you finally get it on him because they're, they're embarrassed. They don't yeah. want to admit mm -hmm. that a cousin of theirs was living in the house. But, you know, again, it... It, it didn't have anything really to do with all the other cases of people living in that house, the things they experienced. But then again, maybe the drug abuse brought something out. Maybe when you're in that frame of mind, maybe some things are like, hey, you're easy prey. You know, I can mess with you. And people are going to think you're on drugs. They're not going to believe you when you try and tell them about the things that happened in that house. And it's the other people who aren't with a drug habit going into that house experiencing the same things. So, yeah, you're right. You got to be careful. You never know what someone's state of mind is. You don't know if they're looking for attention. I've got a guy who sends me an email at least once, if not twice a, a month from Westport, Massachusetts, who is absolutely yep. convinced mm -hmm. he's got something attached to it. Everybody him. knows about this guy. And, yep. uh, and it's just gotten to the, I've even sent him back emails going, bud, we've already talked before. There's nothing I can do for you. Two weeks later, I've got another email from him. Yep. And there's, I mean, he's a frequent uh, conversation piece on Facebook yeah. amongst investigators saying like, oh, this guy is out sending out a fresh batch of emails again. Um, and, and there's there's more of that than people understand. I have a friend who was doing some investigations on Cape Cod because basically thinking like, you know, there's one real paranormal group on Cape Cod. They're busy all summer long with all their tours and right. everything. So they need somebody that can be out there doing investigations. I don't know why people are worried about stepping on territory, but some people are. And, uh, it's, I mean, it's not a territorial thing. Like, a doctor never says to another doctor, like, I should have been the first person to take care of that person. You know, it's like when people need help, they need help. But anyway, so she was uh, doing some cases on Cape Cod, and uh, she said she had to stop because almost every case that she was being asked about was somebody that had died of a heroin overdose. Wow. And she's like, I don't, she's like, I couldn't tell, like, who was and who wasn't. So they're telling me, oh, my friend overdosed, and oh, my my brother overdosed, and she's like, I don't know if I'm going into a place where people are still using yeah, it. Yeah, right, right. You know, so and I was like, well, I can totally understand that, but you're like I said, you're gonna give up some cases that are probably legit because you're just not sure. Yeah, you know, and you can do as many as you want. It's not gonna make you perfect in seeing the warning signs of everything. You know, like you, you guys. We're doing it for a long time when that case came up and the one in Coventry, yeah. there, you know, and, and so it still took you a little while to see the warning signs. And I know that we've talked about cases that you've done where, you know, you're into it before you start to see some of these signs where things don't start to add up. So you can be fooled. Um, Especially when you're seeing actual paranormal activity. That case in Coventry, it was it was obvious to me that the the father of the family was the one that was tormenting the family there was a, a drug and drinking problem yeah. with him but i was standing in a room and there was a five-year-old girl in the room way behind me and up on a mantelpiece covered in knickknacks a light bulb that was buried under stuff came off that mantelpiece it was on my video and yeah. smashed in the middle of the floor into you know a hundred pieces and as I'm sitting there in shock that that just happened, I turned and that five-year-old looked at me with the creepiest look I've ever had a five-year-old give me and just giggles and walks out of the room. Yeah. So, I mean, there were moments, and I mean, we had a guy who was reading the Lord's Prayer and Matt's K2 meter was like absolutely freaking every time he spoke. So there were moments that made you go, there's something going on here. Is it just mm -hmm. PK? You know, what is it? But then you'd see these signs that are like, yeah, this this is like that picture he's showing me is, is a fraud. That's not a real photograph, and I'm not stupid. But yet I saw some other things that made me go, there is something going on. But I wash your hands, walk away from it. You'll right. never figure it you, out. Yeah, you You'll can't never be figure certain. it out. I mean, I suppose, I mean, if I'm just spitballing, you know, you've got somebody that's in that situation, and maybe they're faking something to get attention or to cover for it or anything. But then the real stuff is kind of drawn into that. Yeah. You know, the real stuff is attracted to that. And that's that's the problem with a lot of these these cases that 
people take on that they shouldn't is there probably is legitimate activity going on because of the other stuff that's going on is probably making it either easier for people to perceive it or to notice it or maybe you know if there is this darker force out there it's it's drawn to it yeah so it's uh it's certainly and it's something that's something that rosemary was very good at you know being yeah. able to to not only um you know write about it but to also go out there and look into it herself and and she always had a pretty good compass for what felt right and what didn't feel right uh in that regard so it's 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 tough that we you know that we lost her especially since i it, i guess it happened pretty suddenly yeah uh and she was what uh was she 69 uh years old or 79 years old no 60 okay so it, early 60s yes. no i think she, it was it ended with a nine whatever it was hold on i'll, I'll look it up and be exact well we probably or she maybe, looked maybe for she her just, age <laughs> oh yeah she definitely did uh, and one thing about her too is like she never, you know, some of these other people kind of aged out of being able to do stuff. But uh, I, I'm saying mid sixties, sixty nine years old. Really? She had just turned sixty nine July eighth. Oh. So, but she's somebody that never, you know, never slowed down. You she know, always she had that even keel, very calm demeanor. She uh, she probably had one of the best wardrobes <laughs> of anybody in the paranormal. <laughs> yep. She uh, she dressed like Stevie Nicks a lot of the time, yep. uh, but that's you know it was all part of her persona, and um, and I think with some of these older folks that we're talking about the, this this previous generation, you know some of them kind of had to have that that gimmick. Well, I'll tell you someone who I think is f filling the void as we're losing these people. Uh, Nick Redfern. Mm -hmm. mm. Now there's Nick Redfern. He, here's a guy with style. And uh, I just read his uh, Richard uh, Dolan. Yeah, I just read his uh, Encyclopedia of Monsters, you know. And uh, it, I think I think he's somebody that you know is one of those people that goes around the world, does get his fingernails right. dirty, and 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 will hang out with other investigators and weigh things and have intelligent conversations. And That's why he says nice things about Rosemary and and uh, you know uh, Ken Gebhard and people like that. So I think that even though I fully understand what you're saying is we're losing these people and it is alarming to think is there anybody going to fill their shoes just off the top of my head i could say i could say nick redfern is definitely well, picking up the banner and right carrying. and i agree and i'm not disparaging anyone no 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 that. no no not at a, all it's not just at all. a different world yeah uh where there isn't the ability for them to become these mainstream superstar well yeah. i mean even mainstream it was still very fringe but you know to become these superstars i i think that we do put a lot of emphasis not we, yeah. the people in this room, but people that are in, into the paranormal world, uh, and I won't categorize that as saying just investigators, but people who just have an interest in this, there is a tendency to uh, put the people that are on television on a pedestal. Yes, yes. And and I find, listen, I have a lot of friends that are on TV, and, and I think a lot of them are great investigators, but there's a lot of great investigators that aren't on television. And so I think that there's... You know, a lot of people that aren't getting a spotlight that that should that could be part of that next guard, uh, but it's just a matter of either they don't seek it, or it doesn't seem to find them, or what have yeah. you. Uh, because maybe we don't need to have a spotlight on this. Maybe there just needs to be people out there doing the good work. Maybe because people like Rosemary and and Zaffis and Hans Holzer and and the Warrens and all these folks that came before had that spotlight thrust on it, that it made it acceptable. And then we don't need to keep people and, out there and, anymore. And of all people back in the day, who was the guy helping put the spotlight on these people? Merv Griffin. Griffin. Mm -hmm. I remember being a young kid and my mother going, oh, hey, Merv Griffin's going to have another ghost guy on this you know, today or a UFO guy. And, and Merv used to do a terrific job interviewing some of these pioneers, you know, uh, you know, whether it was ufology or, or whatever. And I can remember Hans Holzer and, and the like being on the Merv Griffin show. You don't see that nowadays in the talk shows. No. Because they'd be, it'd all be like silly and let's giggle about it. And, oh, isn't that funny and silly? Let's move on to the next topic. No, but he, yeah, Merv he wanted Griffin to know. Was like, no, he would screw his butt into that seat. And he'd hang on every word they had to say. One of the, so I, I think a lot of people, again, you guys are older than I am. So, you know, um, you you saw stuff on television that maybe I didn't see till later on in life, but I know you know In Search of was a pretty oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah a pretty relevant show to a lot of people in the in I've got the, them all in DVD. <laughs> but I don't I don't think it had the the actual power um, that it did 
like, let me let me put. I don't think it was a big television hit. Well, uh, uh, as my recall, it was. A it was. Hit. Uh, it, it had a draw because I yeah. know everybody I hung out with watched it. Even yeah. people who were skeptical would still watch, watch it. it. What, yeah. So when and did I it think air? It, I, but it was one of those shows you, a lot of the people didn't talk about watching if yeah. you weren't into it. So so what was it, 74, I think, I want to say it started? Yeah, 74, 75. Uh, 76? Maybe First episode right. was April 17th, 1977. There you go, okay. okay. So I just I just want to make sure I have it right, because I watched it on A&E as a kid. Yeah. That's where, that's where I learned, the learned of it from. Of it. Yeah. So this this is saying that it, it so it originally was a syndicated show. Yes, it was. Sorry, so that's what I'm thinking is yeah. it, it didn't it wasn't a network show. No, no. That had you know the 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 eight million people watching it. No, like in those network days, shows did in those days. The only network shows were the excellent ones that Rod uh, uh, Serling did. He did one on UFOs that was absolutely outstanding, and I remember I think uh, even Orson Welles hosted one. And uh, Peter Graves did a very good one yep. at Bigfoot, I remember. Hello, this is Peter Graves. So if I'm thinking <laughs> right then, so if that's a syndicated show, and obviously, yes, so people will have seen it, but it's not going to be this cultural phenomenon. No, 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 you're correct. Uh, so based on at least what I'm aware of going back and, and looking into things, was the first big television show to feature paranormal investigation on it would have been that episode of That's Incredible. Yeah. Because yeah. I think it was 1980. And then, and then, of course, then you had Unsolved Mysteries was a pretty good one. Which for, came in the later 80s, yeah, right. Yeah. And then Sightings. And but I think yeah. I think that's incredible. I think it was 1980 that they featured right. a paranormal investigation on the show. I think that was the, the, the Toys R Us, I think, that had the ghost in it. I yeah. think that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so if that's the case, I think that would have been like the first big network television exposure for a paranormal the BBC, research. The BBC uh, had its moments where they actually went out with the ghost club. And always the, more and that, yeah. open to that yeah. topic. Yeah. You know, all it took was, you know, some lord to open up his manor and the BBC mm-hmm. could go in there with their cameras. There but. was also the occasional odd by, odd ball PBS uh, specials that they would do on them too. And they were BBC. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and then I think it was a BBC show or maybe... Maybe it was Living TV, but there was a network in the UK that that created the first Ghost Hunter show that then came and aired on A&E in America that nobody really paid attention. Like, I don't know anybody that watched that show. What, Ghost Hunter? The, Ghost Hunters. Yeah, yeah it was The good. first Ghost Hunters. Yeah, it was, It was the, the British was, done, what, in the early 90s? Yeah, I think 96, uh, I, 97. I've, I've watched it recently on uh, Amazon Prime, and I find it to be an excellent show. That's, His, history based. Let's talk to witnesses. You know, let's let's talk to some historians. Let's talk to some members of the Ghost Club, and I thought it was a very well, you know, very you know, well balanced show. But, but that's what most again, people say. But not a big phenomenon is what you're right, saying. Right? They say I, yeah. I watched it. I've seen it, but yeah. I didn't watch it when it first came out. Exactly. Um, I think one of the first shows that I saw that addressed the idea of a place being haunted, as stupid as it sounds, but I think it helped get a lot of people that are doing this now into doing it was that show on MTV fear. Yes. Because although yeah. they're all places that we've either been to or have on our paranormal bucket list or what have you, they all kind of went by different names because back then they were afraid it was a bad thing to have yes. people think you were haunted. Yes. You know, like a like Waverly Hills was on that show under a yeah. different name uh, because they were trying to make sure that nobody ever showed up trying to look for ghosts there. And now it's their entire business model. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's it's definitely had a shift. But that show, while not looking for ghosts, that wasn't the point of the show. It was right. it was not to prove or disprove hauntings. It was just to freak people out. And it was a competition. But I think that kind of opened people's eyes to seeing. And I think, you know, in a way, you wouldn't have had the success of Ghost Hunters without that show. For one simple reason, it proved that people would be willing to watch a 44 minute show where a good half of it was in night vision. Yeah. Whereas I'm sure that was a big problem for a lot of, uh, you know, television producers to say, well, we just can't film in the dark and nobody's going to watch night vision for yeah. half the show. Yeah. Um, and then of course, most haunted comes out and that, that kind of helps too. But, um, a, a funny thing, uh, when I was doing the research for my presentation at ocean state, I'm going back and I'm looking through all these different paranormal shows and one of the misconceptions that people have about MTV's fear is that it, that it was it was canceled because people didn't watch it, and that's not true. It was actually MTV's number two show when they canceled it, 
but they canceled it because it was too expensive to produce. Yeah, that's what I was going to guess. And they couldn't afford it. And I'm like, yeah. well, how much money? Because I know what it costs to put on a paranormal show now. <laughs> I mean, how much money was MTV right, you know, spending to make that show? Because you know, now you can get a haunted place for a thousand bucks a night. You know, what were they paying? Were they like, hey, we'll give you $15,000 if you let us film here for one night. Like, well, well, I mean, okay. I, I guess when it was one show asking one time and that was it, yeah, they'd want top dollar for it. But now that you can get five or six productions into a place a year, you know, you can come down on your price a little bit. So I don't know. Does that make the price go up or does that make the price go down? Supply and demand, you know, who knows? But I, I can I can see why, you know, it was expensive to produce uh if they were pay paying a lot of money for the locations outside of that what the hell were they spending all that money on yeah you, you know maybe the yeah. maybe the night vision stuff was more expensive then uh but it wasn't like they were putting um you know celebrity it wasn't you know celebrity no, no, that, the celebrity no. version came later yeah yeah celebrity paranormal project but you know it wasn't like you were paying these people a lot of money uh to be able to do it but anyway it was a it was a cool show and they used the god's mac song for the theme song that was really cool and and that was you know one of the first times that we saw people with you know cameras mounted yeah, the gopros yeah and, and they were pointed in front of them so that was uh definitely a groundbreaking show but uh, we do have a, a few moments left. If anybody would like to call in, 508-996-0500. We have made this caller wait a little bit. Good evening. You're on Spooky South Coast. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, how's it going? Good. I uh, I have I had to call because I've I've got some immediate facts and figures that uh, came will be coming to fruition the middle of this coming week. So so hang on a second. Andrew, have you heard this caller before? No, I have I'm not. I'm sorry, caller. I don't even know your first name. I should ask your first okay, name. Okay, uh, Mark. All right, so this is Mark. Mark's been giving us uh, some, some information over the last, uh, it's been about a year now, right, Mark, that this has been going on? Uh, actually, in my life, it's been going on for about three years. Uh, I've been in touch with the radio station probably about that amount of time. Okay. But uh, the... Uh, so just give Andrew the Reader's Digest version of, of what's been going on. Okay, Reader's Digest. Uh, uh, for the past three years, I've been. Uh, I, I was notified originally that I had won several million dollars, and uh, from from Publishers three, Clearinghouse, right? Yes. And what happened was, over the past three years, up until this past week, I got the complete lowdown. Um, the I should have uh, figured on the bloated amount of money that it was phony, but I do have, like I said, facts and figures. Um, because the last person I spoke to a few days ago was working out of William Barr's office. And I think I told you that the last person prior to that was Justice Department. Well, that gentleman was a scammer. He took the identity of somebody in the Justice Department. And I put my foot down to him, and then I dialed the number that I have, and I got uh, the office of a uh, Mrs. Harris from the from William Barr's office. And now I know that I'm dealing with the right thing because I kind of put my foot down, and today I got a phone call from the general manager of Publishers Clearinghouse. And um, I didn't win that. I should have figured that that bloated amount was fake. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I told you uh, billions. Yeah, that seemed like a lot of money for Publishers Clearinghouse. I mean, nobody buys magazines anymore, so right. I couldn't imagine well, they'd have that much money. Well, what I found out today is that I will be receiving uh, between, like I said, uh, this is a little more realistic, between uh, 3 and $5 million, and I believe two vehicles, I think a, a Mercedes and a BMW. And uh, I, got, I spoke with the general manager of Publishers Clearinghouse, and I explained to him what was going on for the past three years, and uh, he could not believe it because I think I told you, which I have sent out approximately $10,000, which that will be refunded because it didn't go out of the country. So you've you've paid out of your own pocket ten thousand dollars to try to get this money that you were told you want. Uh, right, because of the scammers. The mm -hmm. publicist clearinghouse is not the scammer. What happens is when you get involved, a lot of people. Uh, in fact, this I mentioned a few names, and uh, this gentleman told me that those people had had worked for publicist clearinghouse and they were fired for scamming people who had won. 
and they haven't caught up with all of them, but they caught up with a good number of them because I mentioned a few names, and he said, oh, yes, they used to work for the company. <laughs> so I said, well, that's interesting. So, uh, but anyway, that's the, uh, the figures I came up with today, and um, uh, he, he was going to deliver today. The only problem was, uh, you remember I told you you had to have a certain amount for taxes? Right. Well, he wanted that today, and I told him, I says, I am completely out of money until I receive my pension, which I receive on the last day of the month. Well, so he wants you to pay the taxes on the money that you won before yeah, you yeah, get because, the money? Well, not the full tax. Uh, 25% of it goes to internal revenue before you even see anything. Yeah. Because that's a, a regulation that the IRS put in. Right, but they just they just cut that out of the money that you're receiving. No, they don't make you pay it, it out of your own pocket up front. Yeah, you do, because what happens is the check that I'm going to receive is in my name. So I have to cash that check. They can't, which I told them, I said, well, why can't you take it right out of the check? Well, the check is in my name. So I have to cash the check in order for them to get the money. So this is why I have to send in the 25% tax money. So, so what he told me but, today, but, but he hold wanted, on, you shouldn't have to send the tax money to them. It's not, it's not the full amount. It is 25%, okay? But but you don't pay the tax on the money that you received until the end of the year. Yes. It's not like paying taxes on a, on, a, on a, well, but, maybe on the but, cars. But the, no. But the regulation, the, the uh, IRS regulation is you have to put up 25% before you even smell anything. So then you should give that to the IRS and not to the, well, the clearinghouse. Well, uh, when I send it to this gentleman called today, he gave me a name, this the, the name of the, the person he gives it to me takes that money and he turns it into the IRS, IRS. which is yeah. what these people that were fired weren't doing. They were taking the money and keeping it for themselves. Okay. Is what, what was happening. It's similar to like if you go to a racetrack and you win big, you pay the racetrack the money on the taxes, the racetrack, and then turn pays the uh, state and the IRS. Sim similar type of thing. Yeah, and, and, and you see what happens is now, he wanted, he wanted $900, and I said, well, I have no money. I said, we'll have to wait till I get my pension, and then he wanted to know my age, and I told him I was 60, and he said, oh, yeah, it's going on all over the country. These guys that w used to work for Publicist Clearinghouse, they're taking identities, they're stealing identities of people in the FBI, Homeland Security, Justice Department, but, but me, and they're me... telling the people that, you know, that they, uh, they, need, they want the money to turn to the IRS, but they're not turning it over. Let me just ask you a, a question, Mark. Have you spoken with anybody in Attorney General Mara Healy's office about this? Yes, and all they have told me is, you're being scammed. And I said, well, will you investigate? And uh, they haven't, they didn't until, um, uh, I think I might have told you that there was one FBI agent that I had sent a, like four grand to. Yes. And she was out of that. Boston. Well, they did, they did speak with her. Um, and that's when they, they tried to investigate. And, of course, I was speaking, not knowing, I was speaking to all the wrong people. They, what, they were telling me what I wanted to hear, so I was giving them information. But they were still trying to get the full amount of the money. But they couldn't because I had to sign the check, and they didn't have the check to send me. But somehow I guess they were going to, you know, with all the information that I was giving them, they were going to try and get that. But... Uh, like I say, so when he when this gentleman told me today about the nine hundred, he could, I could have had it delivered today, and then he he said to me, well, how old are I? I said, well, I'm sixty. He said, well, we can get you a senior discount. I said, it doesn't matter. I said, I won't get any money until I get my there's, pension. There's, but there's no senior discount on paying taxes for money that um, you won. But for sweepstakes, there is. I uh, listen. Do me a favor, Mark. On Monday, I want you to call. Mara Healy's office. Oh, and I, 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 like I told you, I've already been through it, and 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 if I can, uh, I can. T uh, I'm trying to think of everything that I can tell you. Okay, but it's a it's a matter of between three and five million dollars that I'm going to get with two cars, and what it's going to be is. Um, you see, it it sounds like a scam, and of course, I told her like this this guy that it I spoke to. Like he it. said, it "Can you get any money?" And I said, "I can't do it because all my friends are gone that I borrowed money to. They think I'm scamming them because I haven't got the prize yet." 
Yeah, I, I l- listen and just hear me out on this. I want yeah. you to call the attorney general's office and tell them forget all the other stuff that happened. You know, forget all the other stuff that you've gone through. Just in the process of winning Publishers Clearinghouse, just in that process alone, is it common for them to ask for you to send them the money? Because here's the thing. Publishers Clearinghouse, if you believe their business model, now I don't know how much of this is staged for commercials or not, but they generally present it as, we show up and surprise you with a big giant ass check at your door, and they're not going to surprise you if you're paying the taxes in advance. Can I get to that? Sure. Remember I told you I asked for a private delivery. Right, but I'm just saying there... As a private delivery, I would not get the national television which is fine my door. but those those same other people would have to the people that don't get private delivery would would have and first of all if they reached no, they out to you the taxes too but if they the, reach the 25 percent, they would pay up front so you're saying the commercials are bogus then too no that they don't no, really the surprise people are, the commercials are real then how those people the, the, the what's bogus is when the uh, the uh law enforcement people come in they steal identities of FBI agents and people like that, and those—that's what's bogus. The contest is up and up. Well, I don't know. There's there's some there's some holes in well, well, what they're I telling was, you. I was working with uh, just two days ago, William Barr's office. Okay. <laughs> so, so how 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 much higher can you go? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I guess this, you can, I guess you can this, go to the president. Well, because I had told this woman that I sent which I did send to William Barr's office. I sent about two emails, which she said that they would receive. And, uh, like, I, I trust somebody that, when you go to the top dog, I trust them more than anybody else. And, and Maura Healy's office did comply. And also, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the money that I, I sent in, uh, it just it just went right through me. But um, I'm trying to re- trying to remember all this stuff. Well, we've we've only got about a minute left in the show, yeah, so. Well, well, what I'm going to do anyway is I'm going to wait until the day and Saturday next Saturday. I intend to have a good sized celebration at the station, and if I have to be there all day and be on your show at night, if you will allow me on your show, because you've been most gracious. You, I'll tell you, you and Barry and uh, Listen, uh, Ken I'd... Pittman have been the most gracious talk show hosts that I've talked to on I... the station. Uh, if if listen if if you are here and and throwing a party, we will be here. We'll 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 come in early for it. Okay, not not a problem. Like I said, I'm I'm expecting this, be, and where it's you know where it was so bloated before, this is more realistic. Right. All right. Well, I do have to cut you there because uh, we're okay. we're out of have time. Have a good one, Tim. You as well. Take care. Yep. And that will do it for tonight's show. Uh, we will definitely follow up uh, with Mark and, and see what happens next week. Uh, stay tuned. And and people people say you know that there's there's all these scams out there, and it's true. You got to be careful. Oh, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna follow the story just to see where it goes, so that people you know understand out there. Uh, what's real and what isn't real. So why don't we say goodnight for tonight. We'll be back next week with more Paranormal Talk. Until then, for Matt, for Matt, for Stephanie, for Andrew, for Kylie, I'm Tim. Stay spooktacular.